Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to a uh, <laughs> waking, waking, Karen. Hello. I'm just getting us set up on Facebook. How are you guys doing this week? Good to see you on here. I'm just going to set us up on Facebook. And Dr. Bart, you're on. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> I don't know where I am. <laughs> it's all right. It's evening here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Um, so just give me a couple more minutes. I'll get this set up, and then we'll get we'll dive in. Um, I'm uh, I'm interested to hear your tips tonight. Yeah, these are uh, this is interesting. So because I think everyone, I think everyone loves to go out to eat. You know, like it's just. I think, I think a lot of people that will be listening here tonight. Um, I've started probably eating more and more at home, especially over the last year, and and you. No doubt you eat better when you're at home, but sometimes you just love to go to eat out. Like you just want to have a break and go have the whole experience. And I, I love eating out. Um, and yet, and we'll talk about it tonight. Like it's become um, a time just become more and more of a challenge. So we'll, I'm going to help navigate those roads. And really, what are we looking for? And, and as much as anything, Karen, help really establish like, what are we looking for in a restaurant or, you know, a cafe or something? What are the gold standards? And partially, my reasoning for doing this is hopefully that, you know, as a community, as a tribe, that we keep raising the bar, that we keep, you know, pushing the envelope a little bit, um, ultimately, because if we don't ask, if we're not, you know, putting our money where our mouth is, we're not asking restaurants and purveyors to step up their game, they just won't. And I, and I get this, especially now that my wife and I have, have you know, dove into the restaurant world that we own our own cafe. Um, we get both sides of this. We understand it fully yet. Um, we also know that it is fully 100%, you know, a possibility of doing, you know, a, a, a four star gold standard restaurant in this category that we'll talk about tonight. So with that being said, again, I, um, I'll just start by saying thank you everyone who's, you know, here tonight again. And remember, if you have questions, about anything, I guess, really, you can leave them in the comments. If you're live here on Zoom, you put them in the chat, or if you're on Facebook, join us tonight. Welcome back. Loved having you. And uh, just put your comments in there and send them, and then they'll get them to me, and then we'll do our best answering them tonight. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, okay. Yes, we're live on Facebook too. Should we get started? Yeah, let's do it. <clears throat> Awesome. Well, welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Health Made Simple Show. I'm here with our host, Dr. Bart Precourt, who has been a healthcare practitioner for over 20 years, practicing a range of modalities, including chiropractic, kinesiology, uh, nutrition and supplementation, and functional lab testing, all out of his clinic, Balance Health Studio, in Seagrove Beach, Florida as well as virtually all around the world now that we can jump on Zoom and do amazing virtual consultations. He is also the founder of the Health Edge program, which is a cutting edge health program for entrepreneurs and executives wanting to take their health to the next level. Uh, he's worked with celebrities and athletes all around the world, uh, sharing his health tips every week right here. So you talked a little bit about gold standards of eating out. What, what do you mean? Should we start with the gold standards? Yeah, let's start there. And then we'll kind of navigate through like, what do we do? How do we figure out if we're going out? Like, how do we make the best of whatever our options are, are going to be? Um, so yeah, there's, there's really gold standards when it comes to, you know, a healthy restaurant. And it's, I think it's important right from the beginning, to start off the difference between uh, a good, like, oh, that place is really good. They had really yummy food. And that place is healthy. And we have to continue to make sure that we recognize the differences and also kind of honor for our own health and our body. And even when we're talking to others, let them know that. And listen, you know, like healthy, it does not mean bad. Like it doesn't mean, doesn't mean that it can't taste good is what I mean. Sometimes when we say, man, the place is so good, it could be like the donut shop. And, <laughs> and we refer to like good as being yummy. And it's, it is important as we continue to move forward that we just kind of like, we keep it clear, like that's a really healthy place to go that has awesome food and everything tastes great. Or that place has, you know, it's, you know, it may not be the healthiest, but those donuts are amazing or whatever it may be. So, you know, kind of understanding that helps us understand these gold standards. Um, you know, and I tell you what, I think if I did a show like this, like 10 years ago, I don't know that much people would have that much interest right now. This is the name of the game. The, like the name of the game, and it's probably Karen never been more important now 
for us to look for healthy foods to put into our body than it ever, ever has been in the history of the food industry. The challenge, um, the challenge we have right now is that our, the food industry is getting away with putting more and more chemicals into our foods than they ever have ever, 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 ever. You know, in GMOs and stuff like that, they're only about 15, maybe 18 years old now. Um, and they keep on like, you keep on advancing science on, and that science isn't to the benefit of the human body. The science is the benefit of, of how can we grow this fat, this crop faster? How can we grow it, you know, without the bugs bothered, without the birds wanting it and stuff like that. So it is time and it is time for us to raise our bar and our consciousness and awareness about, you know, where the food's coming from and what's going in. So here, the, here the, with that being said, we'll talk about all that tonight as well, because each topic of the four gold standards are going to include a little bit of that. So number one is this, when we look for a restaurant, we're thinking, all right, I want to go to a healthy place. First thing we're going to ask, is the restaurant 100% organic? Now, and we'll talk about organic in just a minute, why that's so important. Now, I'm not talking about, do they have like, some arugula in the restaurant that is organic. I'm talking about an organic restaurant, meaning that everything, every item in that restaurant is organic. You know, now that we own our own, our own place, it has also become important, like previ, we've become previ to us, how important that is to our consumers who are out there who want to eat like you and I do, who want to put clean food in our body, but also they don't want to have to ask on every single item. And I, and I also know that once the consumer isn't you know, like confident that everything's going to be there, they don't want to go there anymore. But even though I'm going to encourage everyone to continue to like, I'm not going to say be a pain in the butt, but if we don't ask Karen, then the, the, then the owners, then the people who are purchasing and making the food, they don't know how important it is to us. And really here in our country, where there's bigger markets, you know, the West Coast and the, the cities, Atlanta, New Orleans and stuff, maybe not so much New Orleans, but other markets, Houston and stuff like that, there are organic restaurants opening up nonstop. And we may be the first one and the only one here in our community, but I promise you, we're not the last because this will, because of the, just the feedback we've gotten. I'm sure the other restaurant owners, the, the other purveyors are paying attention as, as well, that people want this. So when I say organic, meaning that the entire, the entire restaurant is organic and not just when they can get the food that way, that they go out of their way to make sure that there's 100% organic food 100% of the time. And listen, I know that's a tall task, but it's a task that's achievable. Now, I only say that because we, you know, we have our place called Prima over there in Seagrove, which is about, you know, five miles from my house here. We're doing it. And yes, does it take some extra work? And we absolutely can do it. And we get an incredible one. I thank all the people, if you guys are listening, you come in and you're joining us. I thank you for all the feedback. My, you know, my wife gets amazing feedback for the fact that we do that. Um, so that that's number one. So it's organic 100% of the time, 100% organic. And again, there's never been a more important time. So even if you don't like to eat out, if you're just shopping for you, there's never been a more important time that there's a huge, this is the biggest discrepancy between organic and non-organic food that there's ever been in the history of food right now. Yeah. And I think um, something you said that was really important is when you're, when you're talking about being a pain in terms of asking for it, like if we don't ask, well, no, it's, I think, um, you know, often if I'm, I, I hear people or I talk to people about buying organic produce and they're like, oh, but I'm not sure that's really organic or I'm not sure that's really properly certified or, you know, it says organic, but I've heard that it's not, it's not properly organic. So they decide not to buy it because you know, it might not be exactly organic, but what they're not realizing is that unless we buy it or unless we walk into restaurants and ask for it, or unless we talk about it, or at least we tell people that we want it by spending our money on organic things, then there doesn't, there's not a market for it. People don't produce more and more of it. I mean, what you're talking about in terms of having more organic restaurants and becoming trendy in certain cities is because people have been asking for it. People have been going to restaurants. Hey, you know, do you have organic, you know, is there organic, produce that you know is there organic food on the menu are you guys organic the more you ask for it the more you spend your money on organic 
food, the more it becomes a market for it, the, the more there becomes more options for us. Because I know in, in my city, there's not a lot of organic restaurants here, but the more we do ask for it, the more people realize there's a market for it and then they'll pop up. Yeah, a couple of great things said there. One, if you're right, inevitably, and probably someone will ask the question tonight, and it's a great question. Um, oh, I heard that the organic, sometimes it's not. And the truth is, we still have to do the absolute best we can because if we're not purchasing, so listen, the way these bigger companies work, they just look at market trends. They look at yields. They just are looking at where, where what's moving, what's not moving. So we have to be purchasing it. Otherwise, we're never going to get it. And although there's not a perfect system, I agree 100%, even USDA stamped organic doesn't mean it's 100%. It could be up to 97%, but it's still better than knowing that your food is a genetically modified, you know, food with chemicals sprayed all over it. Second part. So this, so this, is, this is something that's real locally for us. So we have um, a chain of rest grocery stores around here called Publix. Yeah. 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 So, so maybe you're familiar with them. Yeah. And I don't know if they're in every state or not, but I think they're a pretty big chain. Anyways, um, when we first got here, they'd open, well, we were here and then they opened an additional store, probably just three miles from our house. So I was super excited about it. And traditionally they don't have necessarily organic foods. So we would go, my wife and I would go every day and, and every day we would talk to the, you know, the men and women that were out putting out all the food. We would always be, you know, on the outside at, you know, you know, perimeter of the store and we say, Hey, do you have any organic arugula? Hey, do you have any organic this or any of this? And then no. And then, then they just said, listen, you want to talk to my manager, they'll probably order some for you. So sure enough, we would talk to the manager and they would order. First, it was just spinach. Then it was arugula. We have watched this little Publix down here in Panama city beach, go from zero organic to a massive section of organic and here's the really cool part about it when you go there on the busiest days the parts that sell out the fastest is the organic sweet potatoes is the organic arugula is the organic spinach the organic organic carrots so oh it's legit. so amazing it's it is literally so amazing so then we went to another grocery store a little farther down and one of the things that we love, we love to get organic broccoli and organic cauliflower for, and i don't know why cauliflower is less frequently found organic um, at least around here it has been. So we just kept asking, we kept asking. And sure enough, we eventually got to one of the managers. So the, I want to give him kudos. It's a place called, um, oh boy, it'll come to me in a moment, but a different rest, a different uh, grocery store than, um, um, than, than Publix. We just asked him, could you get some organic cauliflower? Sure enough, a week later, organic cauliflower. So that is the power of asking and it's not scolding him. It's not like trying to make him feel bad or anything. But if we ask and we put our money where our mouth is, sure enough, like it, it's going, it, that's how things happen. So again, there's a stamp for, we want to make sure and ask on a regular basis for organic. And the other thing I'll tell you this, when they have it, when restaurants have it, when we have it, when someone asks us, we are proud and we are happy to share that information because as because as owners, we take that pride and so will their other restaurants when they are only getting, you know, like locally farmed source foods and stuff like that. They're proud to share that stuff. So yeah. don't feel bad about it because when you do ask them and they're able to say yes, it's also like acknowledgement for thank you for being awesome. Yeah, for sure. Well, speaking of locally, locally derived or locally sourced, what, what's the difference there between kind of local, locally grown local greens, local produce compared with organic? And that's a great question. So it kind of goes like this. To literally get the certification of USDA, uh, that green little organic stamp, there's a lot of money that takes place, a lot of processes that take place, a lot of filing of papers and all that kind of stuff. A lot of the local smaller farmers simply don't have the time, energy, and resources to get that stamp. So what does that mean? So that means that we don't know until we do know. And that's where having a relationship with your farmer and relationship with the actual farms and the food that they're, they're, they're producing becomes important. So we have a lot of, um, you know, like, what do you, um, the weekend farm, I forget what you call it, but like, yeah, like um, farmer's markets, yeah, like a farmer's market and they're not all organic yet. If you poke through and you talk to some of them, those, you know, the ones that are really prideful, about how they farm and how they keep the things clean and, and how they're going to feed their animals and stuff like that. They'll tell you firsthand. And in those scenarios, we don't need the organic stamp. 
Yeah. We know that they take as much pride in their food and their animals and their crops that we do about putting it into, you know, into our bodies and making sure that we're putting the proper nutrients into our bodies. So you have to do a little homework there. Now, I'll give you an example, uh, Karen. So organic farms need, I forget if it's at least three, I think it's five years of, of soil time. Of, of guaranteed, like they, they're on a clock of five years that nothing's been put into their soil before they can claim their crops as being, you know, organic. So it starts with the actual farm. So if someone has a farm and they're converting it, let's just say they use minimal pesticides before, you, minimal herbicides, whatever it may be, and then they decided to go organic. They may be producing an incredible pro, you know, product that has absolutely no pesticides or herbicides, no glyphosate, no Roundup on it, but they won't be considered organic until after the fifth year. Yeah. So that is that a lot of that's happening as well as farmers are kind of switching over to, you know, getting rid of some of these things. So there's a lot of them can be in process, but I'll still go with the answer, which is going to be the theme always through the through the night here, especially with how we navigate this is if we don't know, the answer is no, always. Yeah. So if it just writes local on a package and you're in a supermarket, maybe no. But if no. you're at a farmer's market and you're able to talk to the guy who grew it and you're able to ask him, hey, do you use pesticides? How do you grow this? Then potentially that could be as good as organic. Is that right? Yes. You just said it a lot better than I just did. Yeah, that was okay. it. <laughs> um, also for locals, people to you, um, looks like you got the organic cauliflower at Fresh Market. Yes. So yeah, that word just, yeah, fresh market, which is just down the road. So, and, and I, and I share that with you, so meaning that in any of our local markets here, I know that most of the managers, they are happy to hear what we want and they will provide it. I've yet to run into a single grocery store, you know, someone that's running a business and wanting it to succeed that says, no, I won't give you what you want. So think no matter where you are, and listen, I've, I've done some travel before and I've gone to entire towns that literally I'd go to grocery store to grocery store and there was no organic product. I, I've been to yeah. those towns oh, yeah. um, and I know they exist, but it doesn't mean you can't help that happen. 100%. I love that because often we do, we accept or we take, we just, we just decide that there's no organic here, so I can't rather than being empowered to maybe ask. And yeah, it might take you a bit of time. Maybe your town's not going to have organic for the next year even. Maybe it takes that long. But then at least, you know, you can start to see, hopefully after that, you know, after some time and enough people asking, things do change. And so I, I love your your grocery store stories. That's that's awesome. Hopefully that's inspired everybody to go to their local but grocery store and restaurant, right? Because you can ask there too. If you're if you're going in, you're like, oh, do you have any meals that I use with organic? Even if the restaurant's not 100% organic, hopefully maybe that restaurant's going to bring in some more organic food. Maybe they're going to bring in some more organic produce. Maybe they're going to start to think about, hey, there's this market for this type of food. Yeah, hundred percent. And I want to go back real quickly to the word local. So like natural and like antibiotic free and those things, or even grass fed, quite frankly, I'll talk about that in just a moment. Local has been over overly used and abused, quite frankly. So I forget where my, where my wife and I were somewhere recently and it said local, like locally, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, we're sitting there, you got your phones now. So we, you know, we Google it and it was three, 400 miles away. That wasn't, that's not an exa exaggeration. It was like over in South Carolina where they're locally sourcing this chicken. That's not local. Three, 400 miles yeah. away from the restaurant is not local. That, you know what I mean? So it, we're, we're kind of, it, it, it's got a little bit skewed. So again, if you know farmers, um, if you know people that are, you know, like selling chicken eggs and all that kind of stuff, support them. And let's address real quickly, Karen, the idea of cost. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, Big yeah. one. It's, a, it's one of the major reasons, uh, you know, people say why they don't. It's more expensive. Yeah. So the cost of healthy food is the true cost of food. And the cost of chemical laced toxic food is the cost of cheap food. So yeah. that's, that's really so it's we get 
we've been kind of manipulated to believe that if we, if I can offer something that was chemical laced and it's got, you know, glyphosate in it and it's got GMOs and it's got all this stuff and the nutrients are stripped out of it and the fats are broken down and proteins are denatured. And I sell this, you know, a dime a dozen that somehow that should be the standard of our cost. And the answer is no, listen, we, you know, like in McDonald's, like it, it, it's sad, but like you can go there and for 20, 25 dollars, you could probably put stuff, enough stuff. I don't even like want to call it food anymore. You can put enough stuff into their little faces that they might feel full. Yeah, it's not necessarily food and nutrients, et cetera. So the organic, here's the beauty. Here, here's, here's the other thing. And I think a lot of our listeners here tonight, because I know a lot of the people here that, you know, you're eating well, you're cleaner, et cetera. Here's the really, really cool thing about getting healthier. You don't need to eat as much food. I was just going to say that. I mean, you eat McDonald's, you eat your 25 bucks worth of McDonald's, you're going to be hungry again in like an hour. That stuff doesn't fill you up. It doesn't keep you going. It doesn't, yeah, keep you satisfied for long. And you got to spend another 25 bucks getting your burger again. That, that's been one of the real aha things for me, like just as my, my health journey has, you know, and again, I didn't, I didn't start with all four standards. Do we even get to them all yet? We didn't get to them yet, do we? We've only gotten to one, but we're, <laughs> this one's a big one. Yeah, we'll, we'll get the others out in just a moment. But I, and my health journey has kind of just evolved. Um, one of the things that I notice more than anything now where, you know, and I would say that my, my diet's probably, I'm probably 98, 99% organic food that I put into my body. It does help when you own your own organic cafe. That helps. Um, yeah, it definitely, and you work right next to it. So like, I literally get into it every day. So that does help. <laughs> So yeah, one of the things I noticed is that I literally need less food and it just makes perfect sense that we never needed a plate of food that was this big because yeah. all the body wants, all the body wants is nutrients so it can make new cells so you can go play hard again and you can break down all those cells and use up that fuel and use that energy and you just replenish it. it did, and if you replenish the nutrients, that's all it needs. It doesn't need all the other stuff that goes along with it. So um, yeah. that that's the cool part about it is that when we, you know, when we eat cleaner and, and the big picture here, Karen, and, and not to, yeah, let's do it anyways. Like the, the moral issue here too, is that the worse food we produce, the more food we have to produce, which means the more farming, the more pollution that we have, you know, and I, I know there's a little bit of like a gang up on, on, on meat right now in our country, like, you know, and I hear like other people, who really are in the health world or like in the computer world are talking about like what we should be eating and stuff like that. And they're saying, man, we shouldn't eat meat anymore and stuff like that. Well, the, the world also couldn't survive on just vegetables. Wow. We don't have enough farms. We don't have like, it doesn't work that way. God's garden is there for a reason. And it's, a, and if we take out 50% of the food chain, then all of a sudden we're going to have an upside down issue here on our hands. But if we ate better foods, and we were healthier when we eat them, that would have an impact. If you want to have an impact on the earth, that's how you have an impact. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, look, before we move on from organic, we got a question on, on Facebook um, from Tracy. Can you actually define organic? What, what is organic to you? Yeah, so organic, I, I mentioned just briefly about the soil. That, that's the cool thing that it has to start with the soil, how it's, it's actually farmed. So it means that your food that it's going to come from that, 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 let's just say that you're getting a tomato that's an organic tomato. The farm that it came from has no pesticides, no herbicides, no chemicals put into that. So, which is really important. So we don't want our, you know, our vegetables essentially absorbing chemicals or GMO. So with that for Tracy here and for all our listeners, if it is labeled as organic, there's an assumption that it includes non-GMO. And that's so the non-GMO is not on my list tonight but if it needed to be, it certainly would be because that is a, a huge, huge marker. So non-GMO foods, because it's one of our answers tonight is going to be how do we navigate if there's not organic, we're going to do our best to make sure that it's at least non-GMO. So you can get a non-GMO food and the not GMO food are genetically modified. So really what that means is that they've, they've been able to manipulate the seeds in such a way that they already have the chemicals that make them like herbicide resist make them so they're resistant to the you know the different like weeds and all that stuff and things that would eat or interfere with the growth of that plant 
but they're already bred inside the actual seed. The challenge here is we're consuming those. So we are now consuming, you know, glyphosate in or what they call Roundup on a regular basis. So, oh, Tracy, hopefully that helps. It means there's nothing, nothing, no chemicals that are put onto that food or the soil for that matter. Okay. Awesome. Well, let's, um, let's move on to the second gold standard. We've got, we've got four gold standards for these healthy restaurants. Number one, is it organic? What's number two? Number two is uh, gluten-free. Okay. Yeah. So, and then you're going to, we'll start seeing more and more of these as people have more and more health issues with gluten um, and more and more allergies toward it. And uh, then we'll see it for those reasons. And we still, we see a lot of restaurants now that have policy about gluten, like, is that gluten-free? And then they'll ask you, is that an allergy or is this just by preference? Um, you, you're starting to hear more and more of that, but gluten-free, let, let's go to the answer of why first. The challenge here is, is not that gluten by itself was necessarily bad for us, all right? So the challenge here, because gluten is a, uh, is a wheat protein and you know, hundreds of years ago, most likely we were able to digest it pretty good if it was directly coming from you know, wheat and it had a, an oxidation process of no more than say two days, but, or it doesn't happen anymore like that. But even, even with that, I mean, it was even with that, even if that was normal and we were eating wheat re- directly from the farm, the challenge is a state of our health. In years and years, we're talking decades for most of us that we have beat up our guts with chemicals, with stress, with just stuff, birthday cakes and oils and just stuff that we're putting into our bodies. I'm going to go ahead and say that the majority of the population walk around, talk around people have developed some level of leaky gut, leaky brain. And we have, now we have a massive issue and we can't break down the gluten molecular structure. So these glutens get into our gut they seep through our gut and then wreak havoc on the rest of the body. In a nutshell, gluten for, even if you do not, even if you don't have an allergy to gluten, which would be like um, celiac disease. If you have a, food sensitivity to gluten, which I find clinically like 99% of the people do better without gluten. And because gluten now has zero nutrient value, it's bleached out for the most part. It has no value to give us. The B vitamins are all stripped out. There's nothing there left for us anymore. That gluten can, can create an inflammatory response, a minimum, a minimum Karen of 30 days, but all the way up to a hundred days of producing inflammation in the gut in the challenge. And that is why, and this happens, you know, on several days a week, I'm doing, you know, like virtual consults, I'm helping people, you know, navigate their health. And one of the big things that comes up is they'll, they'll say, well, I've tried gluten-free or I'll see it in their paperwork. I've gone gluten-free. It didn't work. And, I, and then I'll ask them, have you ever gone 60 days gluten-free? Mm. And I mean, hundred percent gluten-free and anyone listening to this right now, you go just do 30. If you go 30 days gluten-free, I promise you, you'll lose weight because you're going to lose inflammation. And that kind of sort of, not mostly, not just on the weekends. And really what it boils down to when people say, I've tried gluten-free, they've gone an entire weekend without pizza. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm joking, but I'm not. It yeah. means they didn't have pizza this week and they also skipped like the waffles or something like that and they didn't have any muffins or crackers. But very few people that I know that have gone absolutely gluten-free don't know, notice the massive health benefits of being gluten-free. The challenge here is this, when we go out, we go out, what is it, what does most meals start with? Bread? bread? Yeah, so we started off with bread and then the next thing is, what is that bread? We're usually dipping it in what? Wow, meant to be olive oil. But meant to be, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, meant to be olive oil. So we start off with something that immediately inflames us. And that bread, this is going to be crazy too, converts, it creates a higher impact. It influences our blood sugar, like our glycemic, more than sugar does, faster. So it revs us up. So now we have an appetite. Now we want more. Now we're going to read our menu. We're going to want everything on the menu. As long as the timing is right, like when they, instead of eating all the, you know, it's multiple breads baskets. But now that you're doing that, and because there's zero nutrients in the bread, you're always going to feel like you're hungry. So this is a very intelligent play by restaurants. Serve bread first. 
put the smell in the air, but also it's going to create an inflamed situation. That's why people get so bloated. And really, if you really, really, really want to mess up your gut, eat a whole bunch of gluten, put some really bad oils, and then a bad protein on top of that. And that might look like this, bread, oil, maybe a little pasta and a big piece of steak. That right there is like a remedy. Like that's like, that is a gut problem remedy right there. Like that will, that's like, if you want to cause a gut problem, that's it right there. So it's, we're compounding like sugars and starches and then, a, and then a bad protein. So gluten across the board, Karen is one of the ones that we want to, you know, as much as we can influence our restaurants to, to be a gluten-free restaurant. And the beauty is nowadays there are so many alternatives. Like, I don't know if you got now, but like, the majority, and here's how it worked. Recent, uh, three years ago, there was only one restaurant in town, pizza rep place that had gluten-free pizza. Yeah. Now, this, so listen, this is where our money shows up. Now, I think, I don't know of a single pizza place that doesn't have a gluten-free option. Yeah. Now, most of them even have a version, although it's not an awesome one, a version of cauliflower crusted pizza. Wow. Yeah. So the local purveyors for listening, and it only happens because people are showing up, showing up and saying, Hey, do you got a gluten-free pizza? And they're like, damn, I can't, I keep hearing this. I might as well get some gluten-free pizza. And then they do, they do it. Yeah. I think gluten-free is an amazing example of that. What we were kind of talking about with the organic, because you're right. I mean, every Italian restaurant I go to has an option for gluten-free pizza or gluten-free pasta, right? Like they've got a gluten-free option. Uh, almost everywhere you go has a gluten-free bread option. Um, and it's because people have asked for it and there's been this trend towards people not wanting to, to wanting to eat gluten-free, but let's talk about gluten-free breads then, or gluten-free crust. I mean, just because it's gluten-free, how is that? Yeah. Correct. That it's good. So I will say this, that when we're just, when we're just talking about the category tonight, now let's not talk about blood sugar levels of, or, you know, carbohydrates, you know, increasing none of that. Well, let's just talk solely about the impact of gluten versus gluten-free. The gluten-free stuff is, is going to be better. It may have some other stuff in it, but we'll catch that in just a moment in what's going to be number three. But if we can go, at least go gluten-free, the other challenge, Karen, is that for, and this is really, this is really influenced, really special for women to listen to um, because women have a tendency to have more hypothyroidism. And that is a condition where your thyroid starts to slow down. The challenge here is this, that leaky gut will often, what happens in leaky gut? It starts to create an autoimmune response in the body. Literally the gluten, let's just say the gluten molecular structure looks like this. And it slides out of the intestines and it goes into a place it shouldn't be. It's floating around. So the immune system looks up and it goes, hey, you can't be there. And it attacks it and it starts to break down. It does the best that it can. And that creates inflammation when we have that response. Hopefully it's just temporary. Hopefully it's a one shot deal. Challenge is it's not. We put gluten in with our cereal, gluten with our bread, gluten like our sandwich at midday. We have a couple crackers for more gluten. And then we have some, you know, like, you know, pasta at night. So we're living these lives that have just nonstop sense of gluten. So your immune system is out there trying to pick this off nonstop. That's not where the problem ends. This structure of the gluten looks almost identical to the structure of your thyroid hormones. Mm. So now what, and this is, this is really big. Most women who have, who are treating their immune system, like if you come to me and you got a thyroid issue, first and foremost, if you and I are going forward, you're coming off gluten because you will always be pushing your thyroid gland you know, to the brink of like quitting if you continue to eat gluten, because what'll happen is your immune system is shooting down gluten structures but then right behind it is a thyroid hormone and it attacks it as well so this is a big part and especially if you have something called Hashimoto's you're you know it's just you just live your life without gluten and listen it is it's never been easier never been easier there's gluten-free yeah. gluten-free muffins uh, you name it you yeah name it. there's more and more gluten-free options for sure um We've got another question just since we're talking about gluten and the gut on Facebook. Trisha asks, what's the best way to heal a leaky gut and how long does it take to heal? Okay. Yeah. That, Big that's question. A <laughs> question. And, and i tell you what, Karen, just, just a reminder for you to tell me that we got to do an entire leaky gut. We got to do a show on leaky gut. Yeah. Listen, here's, here's the thing for everyone. 
until proven otherwise, everyone's got leaky gut, period. Yeah. And everyone thinks, well, no, I poop fine or I don't have bloating, whatever. Just trust me. You got leaky gut until proven otherwise. Um, if you haven't been eating organic your entire life, you've got some kind of leaky gut. The chemicals get in there. They beat down your microbiome. If you've ever been on antibiotics, there's a high likelihood, you know, and most of us have, there's some people that haven't, but if you've taken steroids, if you've taken other medications, if you're currently on medications, you're beating down your microbiome. That's, that's, that's what really happens here. These last 16 years, if you've been eating genetically modified food, what they do, they beat up your own bacteria as part of their job. That's what glyphosate does. Its job in nature is to kill off these other bacteria, and it's now killing your gut. So with that being said, leaky gut is not a quick, simple answer for me to give on this phone. All, all I will say is this. So what I would encourage you to get with someone like myself, get someone with a practitioner that you're comfortable with, have them walk you through it, the time frame that it takes. Well, before I tell you the time frame, let me tell you the benefits. If you change your gut health, you will change your life. And I'm living proof of this. I used to think that just having like a bloated gut after eating was normal. I used to think, you know, and listen, I guess we've gotten pretty personal on this show. I used to think having loose stool and constipation was normal. And I've always been like a relatively thin guy. So I never was like out of like overweight with a gut, but I always had like a gut issue until I didn't. And then it took me a little while because I didn't go all in and I was living and learning. Like these strategies for leaky gut have really only been really at least from what I've discovered, probably these last six, seven, eight years, whereas functional medicine practitioners, we've really dialed in how to heal up leaky gut and very doable. Now, the time frame, the reality to fix up leaky gut, minimum, minimum. And I'm not saying before you notice benefits, but I mean to heal leaky gut, you're really looking at six months to a year. But here's the beauty, Karen. Like in 30 days, you can start to feel better. Yeah. Heal leaky gut. We're talking about reorganizing the, the entire microbiome in your gut, healing up holes that are literally in your gut, like in, in the intestinal walls, and then down-regulating a lot of the inflammatory markers. So very doable. And when you heal your gut, you feel like a new human. Like you, this is what happens. Then you go out and have gluten. You say, I'm never doing that again, because mm -hmm. you immediately respond and you, and you notice what an impact it has on your body. So let me go to gluten for another couple of things about the restaurant. Cause remember this is, this is how to eat out healthy. So let's just say you navigated the bread and you're like, no, no more bread for me. We still gotta be careful. There's other things that the, and this is why I said the restaurant has to be gluten free because it's an obvious, easy shakedown to say, let's just make our bread gluten free. But the dressings that are, you're like your pasta mixes and all that stuff, Gluten salad dressings, big time. Have yeah. gluten, they have MSG in it. They got all these other things. So it's not as easy as just choosing not to eat the bread. There's a lot of other things. Listen, there's 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 meats that are that are seasoned with gluten sauces and stuff like that. So the really what we're looking for are restaurants one that are organic and two that they're gluten free. And there's gonna be two more here as well. Okay, well, let's let's go on to number three. What what else? So we've got organic, gluten free. Number three is canola oil free. Okay, yeah. big that's time. kind of what we were talking about with the olive oil, right? Talk about that. Yeah, so so let's 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 canola oil is um, vegetable oil is another name for it. It's technically I was just looking this up earlier because I don't really always look up those little details, but it's a, it can be a combination of different rape seeds. And it's really what, it's, what happens is the way that it's processed. Um, so even, even, even when they say that it is an organic um, canola oil, it still should be a pass. So this is a scenario that gets a little bit funky when and it's how those oils are process, processed, but they get denatured. And then all of a sudden when they come into the body, the body doesn't know what to do with them. So canola oil, is you know an oil that unfortunately once it enters the body and because it's been denatured and the way that it's processed very 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 difficult karen to get it out of the body so the way that the body is designed like we're, we're we're on god's earth right so god then gave us an array this entire garden to eat from so let lift it if it comes from a root a plant a tree if it walks in the garden swims in the sea just eat it people it's not difficult right just eat those things and i'll put it everywhere in the face of the earth you just gobble away. The challenge is, is that we have then come up with these like food substitutes. We come up with things like Cheetos and Snickers and like all these other derivatives of what we thought was in God's garden. We're like, man, that apple is sweet, but not sweet enough. 
So we've changed this food chain. And as a result of it, one of the things that we changed were the way our fats and oils, but more importantly to this little story here is that if it's from nature, the body knows how to digest it. The body knows how to process that. So our fat cells in general, the, the simple way to look at this, especially the, the fat cells that we see on the outside, those fat cells are really going to increase in, in size for two reasons. One, the, and if, if they're really part of your immune system. One, they're going to carry excess. If you literally just eat, eat too much and it's from God's garden, you can store excess energy, very much like a bear would do when it goes into hibernation. That's what it uses fat cells for. Moms, when women, when they get pregnant, their fat cells will increase in size, literally increase in size. So there's enough food storage, energy stores for their babies. I know women don't like that, but that is, that's one of God's like brilliant things. Like let's give them a little extra in case they run out, right? We'll, so we'll protect two lives here. The other thing that those fat cells do is they, they protect us from toxins. So when we put food into our body that the body doesn't know what to do, what to do with it, it doesn't know how to break it down. The gallbladder goes, well, I don't know what you are. I don't know what to do. So every time you put something into the body, there's a little meeting. And the meeting is really between your gallbladder, liver, and your pancreas. They go, hey, what are you? What are they? Oh, it's a, it's a protein. And then, you know, like literally like the, the, the gallbladder and the liver, are like, hey, I got you covered. We'll get a little HCL from the stomach. We'll break you right down. Or maybe it's a... Um, it's a sweet potato and your pancreas goes, oh, I got you covered. This is a carbohydrate. I got this easy breezy. I'll even give it a little insulin. We'll make sure we get it out of the blood system. So the body has mechanisms to handle real food from God's garden, but it doesn't have mechanisms for the toxins. I, I say that that's actually not accurate. It does. It stores it. It stores it into a fat cell. Canola oil is one of the things that your body cannot process. So two of the most dangerous foods out there. I know this, but this is like, when I used to think about this, and these just really bummed me out, donuts and French fries. Yeah. yeah. Like, because you got sugar in both of those. Yeah. And that means your body will suck them up faster. And that canola oil goes right into the cell. Very, very difficult to get out. So we have to be really strategic in knowing how much like these canola oils. And here's the challenge, Karen, it's in everything. <laughs> it's in everything. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. It is why our cultures are getting sicker and sicker. It is why we have a virus that can infect the whole world because our bodies aren't clean anymore. We can't fight our immune systems. We're over here fighting off all this stuff that was our choice to bring in. So when we do get a, a you know invader, we have a hard time fighting. So canola oil across the board is just a no-no. The challenge here is this. This is where it gets really tricky. On The best substitute for canola oil is olive oil. And there are a lot of restaurants that not a lot. There are definitely some restaurants that have olive oil and olive oil would be the ideal thing. Like if you had some, you know, good sourdough, organic sourdough that, you know, didn't have any gluten, you were dipping it, maybe you eat that or something like that in olive oil. The challenge is that really is it olive oil. And here's where we have to ask our purveyors, our restaurant owners, because here's, there's a little caveat here where they, you can, you'll ask and say, Hey, is this olive oil? And then you also, before the waiter leaves the table, waiter, waiter or waitress leaves the table, you got to say, or is it a blend? Oh, yeah. oh this, is, this is unfortunate. It can be labeled as olive oil, even though it may be a blend of canola oil. And this is very popular in the restaurant business. It's not facetious. They're allowed to buy it that way. They can label it as olive oil. Yet you need to know this because if you're out there intentionally ordering organic salad, having an organic grass-fed piece of you know, beef, or you're having you know, a wild-caught piece of salmon, and you're, that's what you want as part of your experience, and then all of a sudden, all of a sudden you know, it's, you're putting you know, an olive oil blend on your salad, all of a sudden the game has changed. Now all of a sudden, these, these are the toxins that you know, create things like visceral fat problems, the fat, the you know, fatty liver disease and stuff like that. Very, very difficult to get out of the body and they pollute it. So they interfere with the way that the microbiome can grow. You know, we gotta like get in there and claw this stuff out. It's, it's doable, um, but it's canola oil free 100%. And there's, it's also in breads. It's in almost all gluten free breads. Like. <laughs> food really any anything you get in a packet crackers like you were talking about any of those kind of um foods yeah. uh, and what about cooking when you're in a restaurant you can also ask what they're cooking with 
Yeah. So, so here's, here's the neat thing. So let's just say, let's just say that you go to your favorite breakfast place. Like, so I love, I love breakfast. It's like, if I'm going to go out like that would be my favorite, like thing, go out and just get eggs, you know, just whatever. So one of the things you can do that's super, super effective is instead of, you ask them, say, listen, you guys cook it in, in canola oil. And they might look at you like, really don't know. They just use an oil. They put it on the grill, you know, and then they put the, the eggs on there and they fry up the eggs. Say, and just ask them, could you cook mine in butter? Yeah. So is, I know it's like, we're like, really butter? Yeah, it's butter. At least it has the fat intact. It's not denatured at that point. So to say, well, you know, if you cook mine in butter instead of canola oil, it, it, a much better impact on, on literally on your body. So this is going to sound a little off, you know, off track, but listen, it, it, and I think some of our listeners are going to understand when I say this, if you've ever been to a restaurant and all of a sudden you're like, uh, uh-oh, I got to go to the bathroom. And it's like, and I got to go now. And it's not number one. Um, that, that is a bad fat, a bad oil has entered your body and your body says, Oh no, no, this isn't going to work out. Like this has got to go and it's got to go now. And you, you know, you end up having, you know, a bowel movement because those oils are coming into the body. So we think that that's a bad thing. We're trying to maybe suppress that, but that is your body's way of saying, Hey, you put the wrong stuff in this end. So it's going out that way. Like it's, and I, I know that sounds kind of a little off track here, but nonetheless, it is, yeah. very, very frequently in where we see those olive, I'm sorry, the, the canola oils. Yeah. We've got a, um, a question here. What about avocado oil or sunflower oil? Yeah, so avocado oil is a great, great alternative. It's one of my favorites. To you know, the sunflower organ oil. Again, it's going to be important that it's an organic oil. So I'm not a hundred percent. If we named all the oils, sunflower, safflower, all of them, one, we definitely want to make sure that they're going to be always organic. The challenge is is really recognizing or knowing how that particular oil is processed. Mm. So whether it's cold pressed or pressed yes exactly so the olive oils the avocado oils the coconut oils we know that those are good healthy and that they're good for us you know and that they're processed properly when we start dabbling into some of those others it's not always the case so i would say do a little bit more homework here but the sunflower oil i believe it's fine as long as you're going to get an organic source okay and then speaking of eggs since we've been choosing about we were talking about eggs we got a, um, another question i usually purchase free range vegetarian fed but should i instead be purchasing organic cage free is the organic more important than the free range versus cage free yeah eggs can be confusing yeah so let's clear that up now what a, what a great question because eggs it gets a little funky and then we start to hear just like we talked about local earlier when we hear vegetarian we assume maybe that's better you kidding me chickens don't chickens aren't vegetarians they eat worms they eat insects. They're not vegetarians. What that means, most likely, they're fed corn. They're yeah, fed corn. soy. Yeah, fed soy. So let me let me. Here's here's the standard that you want to hold with eggs, and it's um, and it's a good standard to have. So the highest standard. There's really five levels, if I remember them all correctly. Uh, free range, cage free. Uh, I forget what that fourth one is, but either way, the highest standard. There's pasture raised. Maybe there's five. Maybe there's four. Um, yeah, pasture raised and then organic. You want to get organic pasture raised. That's the most important. And again, the beauty here, Karen, all of our local places here all offer it. Why do they offer it? Because we asked. We knocked on the doors and we said, can we get they first? They were like, oh, these are cage free. Well, that means nothing. Yeah. And we lived in a barn and never saw the day of light, literally, unfortunately. They never and then they have some like cage free or free range, which didn't mean a whole bunch. Um, and then they ate basically junk. Um, farmers will tell you some of the stuff that you don't want to repeat what they eat here because a lot of it is just, it can be mixed with feces and stuff like that. So it's not, I, and I, I'm going to go back to saying that there's never been a larger discrepancy in more of an important time to organic to the rest of the food sources. The, the gap here is just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That it's more important now in all of our foods, and some are more important than others, that we get more and more organic. So for the person who asked that question, pasture-raised and organic, that's the gold standard when it comes to eggs. And do I get that when I, when I go out um, to my breakfast places? No, I do not. Um, will I still get some eggs here and there? Yes, and I'll talk about some of the things that I bring 
every time we'll do this at the end, every time I go out to eat, how do we help navigate knowing that there's a high likelihood it's not going to be all four gold, all four standards to make it gold? Well, let's let's finish off the four. We've done the th we've done the three. We've got organic, gluten free, canola oil free. What's our fourth gold standard? Uh, soy free. Okay. So, and a lot of people say, well, I mean, they don't even think about soy. They don't eat soy. And again, Karen, it's in everything. Yeah. All the, almost all the salad dressings and all the sauces and all, all of the condiments that are at restaurants um, from the low end all the way up to the high end, you're going to have soy in it. And here's, here's the challenge here. So, you know, someone could argue with me and, uh, you know, or at least say, hey, listen, I, you know, I heard soy is good for you. And so here's, here's how and when and why. If we have organic soy, which is very difficult to come by because right now, I think it's close, close to 95% of the farms that grow soy in our country, Karen, are now GMO. They are driven and they, they are provided seeds somehow through a company called Monsanto, which is now part of, I believe, Bayer. It's just the whole thing's a mess. It's an absolute giant, it's a monster and, and we're not gonna slow it down unless we're doing what we're doing here. Um, so we wanna make sure, well, if, let's go back to soy for a second. Could it be good? Like if I was a textbook, could it be good? If you are getting soybean that was organic and it's in green and you pop it open, it's still green, like literally from God's garden, that organic soybean does have some nutritional value. So it started off very, very innocent and very good. In fact, Karen, it's one of, one of the very few vegetables that I know of, like peas, um, soy are the only, what they consider complete proteins in the vegetable world. The challenge with most like vegetable proteins are not complete. They don't have all the, the nine amino acids we need to actually make a protein structure. But soy is one of them. Soy, that organic soybean has those nine amino acids. So it's, it can be a very, very good food. The challenge is it doesn't exist. So when we go out and we go to like, you know, our sushi restaurants and stuff like that, that soy is not organic. It's far from it. 95% of the soy made, in, I mean, at least 90, it's, I think it's up to close to 95% of the farmers are growing their a GMO, non-organic source of soy. Here's the challenge here, hon, that... The, these are hormone issues and they're significant. One, soy by itself, even if you're eating it organic. So listen closely on this, because what we saw was there was this wave prior to this phase when people went vegetarian or vegan, basically they became massive soy eaters. That's what that was. The, they had soy burgers. They had soy tofu. They had soy everything. Everything was made out of soy burgers, soy everything. So literally, soy everything. The challenge in that, it's a phytoestrogen, Karen. And a phytoestrogen, meaning that it's a plant-based, you know, molecule that's going to spike estrogen mm -hmm. and not the good estrogen. We find that this estrogen spikes what they call estradiol, which is E2. And that is what is predominant in breast cancer. So th this was, this was, this almost gave vegetarianism and eating vegetables a black eye because we found a massive population, a subgroup in the population that were claiming to be vegetarians, there were massive amounts of soy, but we're having this high frequency of breast cancer. And again, there was more correlative than it was causation. So we didn't, it wasn't ve being a vegetarian, a vegetable eating human being. It was a massive consumption of GMO, genetically modified, non-organic soy. And that became a huge issue. It doesn't end there though. So, so it not only does that, it is considered a goitotronic, goitotronic to the, to the thyroid gland. So it down regulates the thyroid function. So we have two different hormone sectors. And how real is this? What does this look like? You go out to eat and you have things like, let's just say you go out for a sushi dinner. All right. And like, like we love sushi. My, one of my, favorite, my wife's favorite things. And you have soy sauce. And then all those little sauces that they make all the little rolls with. So not only does soy sauce have soy in it, but it has MSG in it and it has gluten in it. I know that sounds insane. So now you have a, 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 like all these things. And then you're eating edamame, right? You're like picking all those little green things out and you're eating all this soy. So you're, you're eating all this stuff up and then you go home and the next day you don't know, but there's brain fog. And all of a sudden you're irritable the following day. 
and you don't really connect the fact that all these things that you put into your body were having an influence on your hormones. And this is real. And then when we don't feel good, what do we do? We try to eat our way out of it. So it's this vicious, vicious cycle. So the beauty is, and I think a lot of the listeners here tonight are starting to become a little bit more aware. Like if, like if today was off, like we don't just go like, what was, you know, what kind of water did I have five minutes ago? We start to think, man, like, what have I been doing? What about what I've been consuming, you know, mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, what, what have I been bringing into my body? And we start to think like, what is, what kind of influence is this having on how I function on a daily basis? And if we're always keeping in the back of the mind, you know, my goal is to become a superhuman, right? I'm trying to become the best version of myself on a regular basis. We start to like, Oh, mm, interesting. When I go out to this restaurant, I don't know what it is, but I have all that stuff and it doesn't make me feel good. So maybe I just slow down there. We were talking about before the show, how the cleaner you get. So the more you do start to eliminate this stuff from your life, the more you're not eating sugar, the more you're not eating gluten, the more you're eating less processed foods, you're asking for some of these things in the restaurant, potentially the more sensitive you are too things like then when you do put gluten in or perhaps when you do eat out and canola oil comes into your food. Yeah. And, and this is real. And, and again, this is something that comes up to a lot of comes up as a, as a practitioner. And I know it does for my colleagues as well. And the person that says this literally sounds like this doc, you're like what the heck? Like I've never been doing more for my health than I am right now. And yet the moment I have pizza, I feel like hell. The moment I have some soy sauce, it feels worse than it ever has. And it's, and it's kind of like a complaint, but it's kind of like a holy moly, like, what is this even worth it? So this, this is what it really is, Karen. And this is where we have to be patient in our journeys with health. So that moment that all of a sudden that we're so sensitive to sugar, hey, listen, you take sugar out of your life and then you take it out and then you try to eat a Snickers bar, you oh, blow sweet, like, sweet. You can't, you can't even handle it. Yeah. The, I think one of the best examples is soda. Oh, yeah, I don't, uh, yeah, I can imagine. I can't remember the last time I tried soda, but. Uh, Put a complete out of your life and then we'll bring one back and then you'll be like, what? Like people drink this? Um, so what happens there it really, and, and I want everyone to listen close because I know everyone watching here tonight knows exactly what we're talking about. Like you're doing better and better. And sometimes it feels like it's getting harder and harder. Here's what's happening. You are awakening your innate intelligence you are awakening awakening your innate immune system and this is so important especially after a year of being in a pandemic that i still say quite frankly it wasn't the virus that made us shut down the world it is a bunch of unhealthy people that made us do this because if we were stronger and we trusted our innate immune system and this is this is such an incredible part for us to listen to and listen just hear me out when i say this because this isn't the last virus we're going to focus, we're going to face. And the reason isn't because some politician wants us to have another one. It's because we're weak and we're not getting stronger against it. Like we're not stepping up to fight it. We're looking for outside in answers here, which does not work. Nonetheless, here, when it comes to awakening this innate immune system, here's the analogy I'm going to give you. And you and I were laughing about this earlier. When when we introduce toxins to the body, <clears throat> the body always responds. It says, no, stop doing that. For example, let's just say you have two or three beers and it, oh. you, know, you get a little drunk and like you feel a little bad the next day. Just because you built up a tolerance to having 10 beers does not make you healthier. What happens there as we continuously insult the innate immune system and we continuously ignore through drugs, through medications, through food, through sedating ourselves, as we continuously just stop listening to the body, we stop listening to the headaches. You get a headache, you take a Tylenol, an aspirin. You, you're not, if you're tired, you drink more coffee or a Red Bull. As we continue just to ignore and literally belittle our innate immune system, the, the innate immune system stops sending the signals that it once did because you weren't listening. So it narrows its scope of what it's going to tell you to, to get the alarm system down to, to listen. I'm only going to send you messages when it's critical for life. And that's the heart attack. That's the coma. That's those things that literally like are life changing. 
because that person who gets to that tolerance of 10 beers a night, no big deal, they eventually have a heart attack. Let's not kid ourselves that you know, they're not like, well, they're always did it. No, it caught, it catches up to him. So as we start to awaken the body, we start to awaken that innate immune system. That's always been there available for us. It starts to wake up. And when you put those toxins back into your body, you put those things in that are going to damage your systems, your organs, your glands, your arteries, the, the way that your brain works, you're going to create an imbalance in your hormones. When that happens, your body goes, Hey, here I am, listen to this. And it sends us a message and says, don't do that again. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's kind of good almost that it does. It helps keep you on track, right? If you can just get yourself a little cleaner or get yourself off sugar and some of these things, you know, you, your body, your body does. It, it gives you these messages once you try to start eating it again. So ultimately embracing that very thing to embrace those symptoms like that and just say, listen, just remember your body never lies. It's yeah. always speaking. And the more we get to listen, the more we communicate with it, the better off we're going to be. Yeah. Now, uh, we're running out of time here, but I wanted to ask you about, um, so if you are going to one of these places, you've gone to your breakfast place, um, you know, it might not be our four gold standards. So we've got organic, gluten-free, canola oil-free, soy-free. But if you have got yourself in a situation, maybe you're out with some friends, what are some things you can do if you are going to one of these restaurants that maybe don't meet the gold standards? Okay, so I'll do this real quickly. So one, just look at the menu and think God's garden, even if it's not organic. Always think God's garden. Comes from a root plant tree, walks in the garden, swims in the sea. So let's keep it at least real food. So that would be number one. So you get still get the experience of going out with friends and family. That's number one. So that, that's an easy one. Number two, bring a digestive enzyme. This should be number one. This is, this is how I get away with going out. I bring a digestive enzyme and maybe we, I know it's at the end here, but put the link in. I bring something called Zypan. This is a game changer. I'm not telling you you can eat bad food, but if you use this, it's, oh man, it really makes, it changes everything. So Zypan is a digestive enzyme. It's adding hydrochloric acid to your stomach. So that acid helps break down everything that's coming into your body, including that crap the GMO and all that kind of stuff, the gluten, all of it, and especially the bad meats or maybe the non-organic eggs. So by having that additional stomach support, you're changing the whole game. Because remember, if you just go there and you don't have the extra support, very, very difficult. So there's one I use called Zypan. It's predominantly an HCL product and has some other things like stomach parenchyma. It will help you absorb co collagen better, help you absorb your vitamin B12 better. So just really, really good. Literally, I don't carry my purse because I don't have a purse, but if I had one, that's where I'd carry it. it so <laughs> bring it, have it in your car, you know, always bring, pop a couple, you know, usually I just take two right before the meal. And if I forget, I'll take it right during. And if I forget, I'll even take it when I get home, but give that extra support, that digestive enzyme support. The butter thing I mentioned, anytime there's a possibility, you know, like, it's like stir fry veggies and stuff like that, ask them if they use butter. And then Karen, another little simple trick is, Always get, if you're going to get water, get lemon with it. Mm. Lemon is essentially a source of ascorbic acid. It is a bitter. By getting bitters, you awaken your digestive system. You awaken that di those digestive enzymes. So anytime we can get bitters into the body, even better. Awesome. Love it. Um, Cool. Well, there are some good tips for everybody. Hopefully you guys have, have gotten a ton of value out of that. Let's, uh, let's do the last question. Okay. Last question. There's a lot of, a lot of info, but what is one action our listeners can take tonight to move them towards their goal of becoming superhuman? I think I might've said this before, but just continue to raise the bar, continue to raise your own bar and then, you know, continue to share it out, continue to spread the love and help others raise the bar. Just like my story of the grocery stores, those grocery stores have raised the bar because we were willing to ask and we would continuously tell, you know, like these have now we can do this in every town and every city across the country and across the world, because if everyone does their part and just ask out of love, not like condemning, you know, just let them know that you would love to support them. And if they had these different options, so continue to raise the bar. I love that. And Kim just wrote, thanks y'all. Each Tuesday night encourages me to do better and better for my health. And Kim, that's why we, we do this. So that's amazing. Thank you so much. And guys, if you have, there's a couple of you that asked about some topics we've covered in other episodes. If you've missed last episodes, uh, the podcast goes live on 
uh, all your favorite podcast channels. So um, Google Play, uh, iTunes, Spotify, wherever you want to listen to your podcast, our show goes live. So you can go back and check all the past episodes. Uh, we'll be back next week, same time uh, with another episode of the Health Made Simple Show. Awesome. Again, thank you everyone for showing up and keep doing your thing. Keep sharing things out. Keep spreading the love here. And of course, we can continue to take deliberate action for your mind, your body, overall wellness. You all be awesome.